70 seconds for 70 years. 70 years of exile, dispossession and death. 70 years of a lost land and statelessness. 70 years of the Nakba. You're watching an Al Jazeera news special with me, Peter Dobby. It's 18 hours GMT, Tuesday, May the 15th. And it was this day in 1948 when Palestinians lost their homeland when the state of Israel was created. In this Al Jazeera news special, we'll take you through how it all began and where we stand today. The vision of both the Palestinian people and the Israelis and how external factors have played a major role in the stalling of any potential peace deal. The Oslo Accords are dead and given the events of the last few days, what is there left to build on? As 70 years of the Nakba is marked, we've seen protests all over the occupied Palestinian territory. The call for a right of return has grown louder in the last few weeks as people in the besieged Gaza Strip made their way to the border with Israel. Dozens of people have been killed in weeks of protests that were met with live ammunition as fired by the Israeli army. Now, a political solution to the occupation seems far gone. As one of the main mediators in the Middle East conflict, the US solidifies its support for Israel by moving its embassy to contested Jerusalem. The decision by the US to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel has thrown into question the Americans' role in a potential peace deal. But it's also cemented the stance of the Palestinians on the ground, who came out in their thousands to voice their anger over the past several weeks. But when all is said and done, where does that leave the Palestinians, who are either internally displaced or they continue to languish in refugee camps across the Middle East? As the Nakba continues and the people rise in this act of resistance, defiance, if you will, Al Jazeera will now examine whether anyone is actually listening to what they are saying. The Nakba, or the catastrophe, is one of the longest ongoing conflicts of recent times. Let's take you back now to how it began. For many Palestinians, it was the 1917 Balfour Declaration that determined a course of policy that led to more than 750,000 Palestinians being ethnically cleansed from their homes. That document established the land as a national home for the Jewish people. This would merge with Zionism, a political ideology based on the belief that Jews deserved their own state. There was a trickle of Jewish migration to Palestine during British rule, with Jews making up 3% of the total population. But that changed when the Nazis seized power in Germany in the 1930s. Tens of thousands of Jews fled from persecution in Russia and Eastern Europe to the shores of Palestine. In that short time, the Jewish population jumped to nearly 27%. When the British tried to put a limit on Jewish immigration, Zionist armed groups declared war on Britain. With the Second World War now over in early 1947, the British government handed over the Palestine situation to the United Nations. By November of that year, the UN had adopted Resolution 181. That recommended the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. Shortly after that, war broke out between Palestinian Arabs and armed Zionist groups. From 47 to 1949, Zionist forces destroyed more than 78% of historic Palestine, around 500 villages and cities. At least 750,000 Palestinians became refugees. About 15,000 were slaughtered in massacres and buried in mass graves, many of which are still being uncovered today. May the 15th, 1948, became the official day for commemorating the Nakba, and it paved the way for the creation of what is today the State of Israel. We have teams covering this evolving story at all the key flashpoints. Alan Fisher is in the occupied West Bank. Hoda Abdel Hamid is in Gaza. But first, we begin with Harry Fawcett, who shows us how Israeli Jews and Palestinians are reflecting on 70 years of divided history. As with so many places in this bitterly contested land, in Ein Hod you can find in miniature the story of Israel's creation and the Palestinian Nakba, or catastrophe. Today it's an artist's village. Day trippers browse its galleries, eat and drink in the restaurant that was once a mosque. Asim Abu al-Hijjah was three years old in 1948 and Ein Hod was his home. 
The village came under repeated attack during the Arab-Israeli war. His mother carried him out in the final exodus. He's lived ever since, just a couple of kilometers away from what for him remains the family home. We haven't deserted the area even for one minute, but our new village has no proper streets, homes built without permissions. Your land is being used by them, but you can't set foot in it. How are you going to integrate in this life? Abi Yehoshua was 11 when the State of Israel was declared. As one of the country's leading left-wing literary voices, he acknowledges the Palestinians' pain. But for him, the Zionist project answered two needs, a return home after 2,000 years for a wandering diaspora, and more urgently, a refuge following the Holocaust. In the Holocaust, we had been killed not for territory, not for ideology, not for religion, not for material. We had been killed like microbes. Yehoshua, though, has been dispirited by the changes in the nature of the country he sees as essential to the Jewish character. An inexorable move towards the political right, spurred by 50 years of occupation and the failure to reach the two-state solution he long advocated. I never saw such sentiment of fascism, of racism, uh, 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 that were coming uh, recently from part of the Israeli society. I, I, I'm, I'm scared about it. Uzi Rabi spends most of his time considering threats from without, not within Israel, as head of a prestigious Middle East Studies Center at Tel Aviv University. He regularly advises policymakers. Israel is not a state like any other state. It should not be taken for granted. But the opportunity for Palestinian statehood alongside, he says, has passed. You are using in the 21st century notions of the 20th century. It is too late for Palestinians to demand for a state now because, uh, you know, I mean, there is a Trump administration. I am familiar with parts of it. I mean, this is something which speaks about uh, state minus or autonomy plus. Israel's early identity was closely tied to the secular socialist Zionism lived out on the kibbutz. The socialism has largely given way to 21st century corporate consumerism. Israel brands itself the high-tech startup business nation. The secularism is also coming under increasing pressure from the growing influence of the religious right, which for many non-religious Jews impinges ever more on politics and on daily life. So, generations after those who experienced the dispossession firsthand, how does a young Palestinian citizen of Israel find her place? For 17-year-old Riham Saleh, one way was to organize a history tour of her native Haifa to re-engage her peers in the story of the Nakba. My identity is very personal and it's something that I've created with the years and it's, it wasn't something that I took uh, simply. It's something that I'm very afraid and scared to lose. Uh, as a Palestinian here, I'm always under this uh, pressure to not be a Palestinian, to not feel as a Palestinian, to lose that part of who I am, and uh, I, I cannot let that happen. A.B. Yehoshua has outraged some of his longtime allies on the left by advocating making West Bank Palestinians living under military control in so-called Area C full Israeli citizens. He denies its annexation rather a long-term path towards some kind of confederation and a move against what he says is apartheid. And I put it in the name of cancer, like cancer. When somebody say, I have cancer, you don't regard about other problems he had. He had a heart attack, he had this, etc. First of all, to stop the cancer. Asim Abu al Heja says living the entirety of Israel's history within touching distance of his home has killed him a hundred times a day but it's also kept alive his hope that he will one day return. OK, let's speak to Harry now, who joins us live from Damascus Gate, outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in occupied East Jerusalem. Uh, unprecedented scenes of violence today, Harry. More than 60 people killed, scores more injured, of course, but quieter today, perhaps, where you are compared to other areas that we've been highlighting. That's right. I mean, I think in that piece we were trying to kind of step back from some of the, the, the violence and the extraordinary scenes we've seen uh, this week and indeed in recent weeks and try and get a, a gauge on how people have experienced this 70 years and, and, and what they think about going forward. And I think um, as well, we're a long way from 
in all senses from the, the kind of demonstrations we've seen in Gaza, the kind of uh, Israeli response that we've seen in Gaza here uh, in Jerusalem on this Nakba day. What we saw here uh, just outside Damascus Gate, just outside the old city, was a, a very small protest, only 20 or so people. They were sitting on the steps in the square that I'm in now uh, about three hours ago uh, when there was a, a protest scheduled to take place. Even before it did, a group of more than that of Israeli security forces moved in, maybe 30 or so, and they surrounded them. And then as soon as they started to chant, started to shout Allahu Akbar and, and, and other slogans, they were very forcefully moved out. Uh, young men were, were pushed over and shoved and uh, escorted very roughly up the steps. And then there was a moment where, where a woman protester tumbled down the steps uh, with one of those Israeli security forces and again very roughly handled on the ground and pulled away. So really, although this doesn't show any of the kind of drama that we've seen over the last few days, it does show a much more typical experience of life as a Palestinian living here in occupied East Jerusalem, just how difficult it is even to stage a small protest on this very momentous day for Palestinians. What's the Israeli media reaction to all this been, Harry? Not just the violence, but also the Nakba itself. Uh, well, as, as far as the Israeli media are concerned, they're not really focusing much on, on the, the 70 years of Palestinian experience or, or the Nakba. They are, though, focusing very much on what happened uh, on Monday on the border between Israel and Gaza and how that contrasted with the scenes that we saw in the U.S. Embassy. I was there at the U.S., the new U.S. Embassy uh, as well, and it was really a, a stark difference. This, this group of uh, U.S. Congress people, uh, of uh, U.S. evangelists, of uh, really quite headily uh, celebrating Israeli politicians, chief among them Benjamin Netanyahu, at the same time as, as what we saw going on in Gaza was, was playing out. And the media has been really reflecting that to some extent. Of course, the Israeli media has been very much blaming the violence on the actions of Hamas, saying that that, what they call a terrorist organization, uh, is using cynically the lives of its own people uh, to, to cover for their terrorist activities. Uh, but they did acknowledge as well that split-screen nature of what took place. The, the headlines, the, the front pages, a, a lot of them did show that the contrasting images saying that, as well there was commentary that the Israeli uh, television stations were showing just the embassy, uh, whereas international TV stations were showing both sides of this extraordinary day play out. And so uh, there is some concern, as well as the celebration of uh, what has been widely regarded as, as a huge political success for Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, in securing the U.S. Embassy here in Jerusalem. There is concern that the uh, image being projected to the wider world and indeed the potential for further conflict, for further violence, uh, and that Israel may get drawn into something uh, which, in, in, the, in the language that was being used by the commentators, which could really turn round this, uh, this air of celebration that we've been seeing in recent days here. Thanks, Harry. Al Jazeera's Stephanie Decker and her crew met a family in Gaza who were forced out of their home in what is today Israel. They haven't been able to see their home in decades, which is just 10 minutes away. So the family sketched a map and we travelled to Ashkelon to see what had become of their property. He's my, uh, my, uh, my father and he uh, was searching for uh, our grandfather's grave. This photo was taken in 1984. 36 years after the Soeja family was forced to flee their homes as the Israeli army advanced. The town was called Al Majdal at the time, known in Israel today as Ashkelon. The family had no idea they would never return. And how does it make you feel when you look at that picture? Do you feel anything or is it just part of history? It's not history, it's our life. And until now we, we believe and we will believe and other kids yani, will, will believe that we belong to this uh, area, to this uh, point. My father, he did that to, to tell us that here is your grand, your, uh, your home, your house. Don't forget this place because you belong to this, this place. The last time Mr. Suerja was able to visit his house was 27 years ago. He hasn't been able to return since, and so we agree that we will try to find it. He draws us a map from memory. This is the house south of the mosque. 
We, unlike the majority of Palestinians, can leave Gaza fairly easily. We depart through the Israeli-controlled Eris Crossing or Beit Hanun. We want to know if the house is still standing or if anyone's living there. So we have the map that Mr. Suerju drew for us. We are now in Ashkelon and we're going to try and find the house. According to this map, it is south of the mosque. We found the old mosque. That's where it is. And uh, according to what he remembers, his house is just south of it. A little later, we think we find the house. We video called Mr. Suerju in Gaza to see if it's the right one. He's at work. This is the house. This is the house, yeah. This is the house. This is the house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This, this, this is the door. More low, more low. The, the, the ground wa where was more lo low. Yeah, this is the door. They changed the door and they changed something there, yeah. How does it feel seeing it? I, I, ca I cannot explain what I'm feeling now. I feel very bad. It takes a while for him to take it yeah. all in. He says it's hard to see something that is yours, but you can't even go to look at it. It's very difficult to, for us all, all people here, all refugees in Gaza, they feel the same thing. And you feel that the occupation is standing in your, uh, in your chest. I don't feel well now because I, I cannot breathe well because I feel very bad. Um, it's not easy to explain. Ashkelon is an entirely different place from the Majdal that Mr. Suerju's grandfather and father knew. Despite this, he remains convinced that either he or his children or grandchildren will one day return. Stephanie Decker, Al Jazeera, Gaza. Well, the memories of the Nakba are still fresh in the minds of Palestinian refugees from 1948. They may have aged, but the hope still lingers of a return to a homeland. Alan Fisher with one such story now of a Palestinian from the village of Zakaria in the occupied West Bank. It's been 70 years since she lived here, but Jamila Alayesi still calls this home. I remember living here with my six sisters, our four brothers and our parents. We used to have two other homes here. Do you see the pomegranates? My father planted these. She was just 10 when she was forced to leave the village of Zakaria near Hebron. Jewish armed groups claiming the land as their own. They came after sunset while my brother was loading the camel with barley. They fired a bomb at us. It was a smoke grenade. We started screaming. We went that way. It got dark and we were surrounded by others fleeing with their livestock. They fired at us. And we ran and screamed. This house, this story isn't unusual. In 1948, more than three quarters of a million Palestinians were forced from their home and every day since, the people have been hoping, waiting for a chance to return. It's been a while since she visited, but she can't help but try to make the place look better. Now she lives on the edge of the Daheshi refugee camp in Bethlehem. Built for 3,000, the population in this packed piece of land is now almost 15,000. Her husband was also forced from the village. He took his life savings and bought some land near Bethlehem. That was confiscated and a settlement, illegal under international law, was built on part of it. Israel is above the international law. How many UN and United Nations Security Council resolutions did they ignore? There are now more than 150 settlements on Palestinian land and they're expanding. Not only are they getting bigger, they are building more. And there, they have little sympathy for the immediate past. I think this land belongs to us before the Palestinians even learned what land is. We own this land since our father Abraham. The Arabs spread. This place belongs to us. They don't belong here. I think I returned home after 2,000 years of exile, prayers every day. Four times we asked that we return to Zion, to Israel and to Jerusalem after 2,000 years of expulsion. Jamila Alayesi is old and doesn't know if she'll walk here again. But when she dies, she wants to be buried here, to return to the place. She never stopped calling home. And Alan's live for us here on this uh, new special out of Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. Alan, you've got some developing uh, diplomatic news to go with this story for us this hour. 
Exactly. We've just confirmed in the last 15 minutes that the PLO representative to Washington, Palestine Liberation Organization, for those of you not familiar with the acronym, has been recalled and is expected to be in Ramallah at some point on Wednesday. This obviously uh, because of the incidents that we witnessed in Gaza just over 24 hours ago. We're here in Ramallah as they mark the end of Nakba. The last official event has just wrapped up, which was a torchlight parade through the streets of Ramallah. And throughout the day, there were a number of events, but today has also been marked across the West Bank with a number of demonstrations and confrontations between uh, young people, uh, locals who were marking Nakba, and also the Israeli security forces. We had a number of incidents in places like Bethlehem and Nablus, and just outside Ramallah, where we were. We've seen a number of people being injured, mainly by rubber-coated steel bullets that were fired, but also the after-effects of tear gas. We saw a lot of that happening over the last few hours or so. We've had a number of people who were also injured in live fire incidents. You would have thought after what happened in Gaza, they would have been very rare. But we know at this hour, at least seven people were shot. One person is critically ill after being shot in the back. Many people, as I say, were out to mark Nakba, but they couldn't help but ignore, they couldn't ignore what was going on in Gaza and they felt they had to make the point that they were angry about that as well. Can you give us a sense, Alan, if you can, um, how much of the anger that we're seeing on the streets today is generated not just by Nakba, not just by what the IDF have been doing, but primarily caused by that recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and those pictures of Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump there revealing the plaque? Well, I think people here have not really paid that much attention to who actually carried out the opening, who delivered the speech. What they know is the United States declared Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel. As far as many people here are concerned, that is against international law. It's against the plans to come up with a final peace plan. And Jared Kushner may well be working on a plan of some sort. But now many people believe that the United States cannot be trusted. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there is also uh, anger uh, until perhaps this time yesterday there were many people who were upset with the Palestinian leadership there was an apathy almost that they were going to come out and mark Nakba because they felt they had to but there was a concern that the Palestinian leadership was ignoring the worries of ordinary people that nothing was happening nothing was changing and just in what happened in Gaza really changed that. It unleashed a new wave of anger against not just the Palestinian leadership, but against Israel, the United States, who many people see as Israel's enabler, and also against the international community, because they have heard so many times the condemnation of actions that Israel have carried out over things like settlements, uh, the right of return of refugees, and now what has happened in Gaza. And yet they see nothing, nothing, that changes the lives of ordinary people on the occupied West Bank or in Gaza. And so there is a fresh wave of anger that has been ignited by what people witnessed, not just since March, but particularly in the last 24 hours. So they are angry, angry at what's gone on over the last 70 years and angry at what's gone, over, gone on over the last 24 hours. Thanks, Alan. Well, Palestinian resistance against the occupation has come in many forms, from popular uprising, protests, stone throwing and armed resistance. But how do Palestinians come up against a country that has a fully equipped army, a navy and an air force, with the support, of course, as we've just been hearing, of the United States? What did the resistance movement look like then and what does it look like today? Hoda Abdel Hamid now from Gaza. It's been 30 years since he buried his brother. Ghazi Abul Sisi still remembers the day Hatim, only 16 years old then, was killed by an Israeli soldier. Many consider his death to be the spark that lit the first intifada in 1987. It was a big deal because after that many youths died in the following days. The uprising spread everywhere in Gaza and the West Bank. People took their destiny in their own hands. It's the same today. Hatem was no different than the youth who are protesting at the border fence under the threat of Israeli snipers, still throwing stones, the symbol of Palestinian resistance and an expression of frustration against the occupation and a decade-long blockade that keeps them cut off from the world. 
The idea of resistance is something ingrained in the Palestinian national identity, but next to the popular uprisings, there's also an armed resistance made of several groups which have a long history when it comes to the fight against the occupation. Yasser Arafat remains the icon of the Palestinian cause, but today Hamas, in charge of Gaza since 2006, has the largest and best equipped fighting wing. But most factions have also their own armed unit. The popular resistance has its role, and the armed one has another role. Each have its tactics, but we decide when, where and how we use our weapons, and when we should delegate the people. The two are deeply connected. Who will protect the people in case something happens? Us and our weapons. But many Palestinians are disappointed by their leaders and disillusioned with the poor results the organized resistance has achieved so far. That's why Ahmed Saadet, not his real name, is protesting at the fence with his weapon of choice, a Molotov cocktail hanging from a homemade kite. The Israeli army calls them arson kites, but the most damage they would do is set a fire across the fence in Israel. Stones, tires and kites are the way we express that we are aware that our right of return is legitimate. This is a freedom movement. We don't have weapons, but we are not peaceful either. It's a popular uprising. Our weapons are willpower, awareness and education. Hope is all but extinguished here in Gaza and in the occupied West Bank, except for the dreams of all Palestinians, young and old, to return to family homes in what is today Israel. But for now, and for a brief moment only, the kites can catch a glimpse of life beyond the fence. Hoda Abdel Hamid, Al Jazeera, Gaza. And Hoda Abdel Hamid joins us live now from Gaza City. Hoda, are people there now thinking, well, what happens next? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we speak to young people uh, who are at the border, they will tell you that they will continue going uh, to that border, protesting, hurling stones uh, at the uh, soldiers on the other side, even though very few of these, so uh, these stones actually reach uh, the soldiers, uh, flying their kites uh, and making their voices heard. They're basically there because they think that when they're there at the border, well, they are talking to the outside world. And that's basically their main uh, message. But you know, when you push them a bit further, when you speak to those who are maybe behind them watching the youth uh, being so defined, there is a certain worry. People are worried that there could be another war uh, very soon in Gaza. And mostly people are worried about what is the future going to look like. And many would tell you they have no idea. I was talking also earlier to a doctor and he was telling me that the mental health here in Gaza has become a big issue. That over the past few years there have been a rise in number of people who want to commit suicide, who tr try to take their lives or actually indeed manage to do that, throwing themselves for example from the rooftop of their own house. And he says that 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 is a sign of how desperate uh, people here in Gaza are. And he says the, the worst part is when they come uh, to, sp to ask you, when is this going to end? Well, nobody has an answer for that. And that is the worst part for people to take in. And according to the doctor, it's because of that idea that there is no end in sight to the blockade, to the misery, to the lack of future, that these youth uh, go to the uh, border fence knowing very well in the morning that when they leave their home, they don't know if they will return. Hoda, has Gaza actually come back from the last conflict back in 2014? It hasn't really fully recovered uh, from the last uh, conflict ever since it's been more isolated uh, from the rest of the world, certainly more control, the economy is in tatters, unemployment has uh, increased and especially hitting the youth. You have about 200,000 university graduates who are actually sitting idly at home and have nothing uh, to do and certainly there has been no political reconciliation between uh, mainly Fatah and Hamas that has been extremely difficult. There was hope for that earlier uh, in the year and that, were, that hope was dashed after the uh, um, attack on the convoy of the Palestinian Prime Minister. Well, 
and then there's nothing really else. Talk about peace with Israel, it couldn't be further away uh, now than ever. Uh, when you ask people here in Gaza, do you know about the Oslo Accords? They actually don't know about these Oslo Accords. They never really lived it. Uh, they don't know what they could, what it could bring uh, to them. And they say, well, when they listen or they see on social media uh, what is happening in the, uh, in the occupied West Bank, they don't believe that there was ever a peace accord. Um, so certainly, uh, no, nothing has changed since 2014. If the intention of that war was to put more pressure on Hamas to have maybe the people here stand up against uh, their rule, well, that did backfire. That didn't happen at all. You have a lot of criticism about Hamas. You see, you hear that more and more, and Hamas knows that. Things are extremely difficult for people here, and it's extremely difficult for the group now to control uh, people here. But each time there is this sort of... Um, uh, 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 this sort of events unfold like what we saw on Monday along the border, that enormous uh, toll that the people here in Gaza had paid, well, certainly they do rally more uh, towards their leadership because there's nowhere else to go, there's no one else to speak to and there's no one else to listen to. Hoda, thank you. Well, the names of the towns and the villages which became Israeli are part of the collective memory of Palestinians who lost their homes in 1948. Priyanka Gupta traces now how communities and families were airbrushed out of existence during the Nakba. For a people without a land, a land without a people. One of the arguments made by European Zionist leaders to support the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. Palestinians say it was a phrase that sought to erase thousands of years of their history and rendered them invisible. Some historians point towards a larger Zionist plan of what's been described as the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians designed to empty the land of its people. More than 530 main Palestinian villages were destroyed by Jewish paramilitary forces. Entire populations were driven out of their homes. They and their descendants are forced to live as refugees to this very day. Kisaria, for instance, was once a thriving Palestinian village in Haifa district. But in February 1948, Zionist forces expelled hundreds of people. Zionist Haganah and Palmach forces torched and destroyed most of what is now a coastal town by the Mediterranean Sea. And it was done while it was still part of the British mandate. Tantura, another coastal village built on an ancient Roman site, was destroyed and its inhabitants cleared off days after the State of Israel was declared. It's now a small Israeli beach settlement known as Thor. The port city of Jaffa was once described as the heart of Palestine. It was the main trading and commercial center and a hub for Palestinian art, theater and cinema. In April 1948, Zionist forces captured Jaffa despite the UN partition plan designating it as part of the Arab state. At least 70,000 Palestinians were driven out. Arab homes were ransacked and looted. Jaffa has now become Yafo, part of the Tel Aviv-Yafo area. British forces too played their part in expelling Palestinians from their land. Tiberias is a case in point. In April 1948, British troops evicted about 5,000 Arabs before they withdrew from the city. Zionist paramilitary groups captured Tiberias soon after. The same pattern repeated itself in Haifa. Haganah fighters captured it the day British soldiers left. At least 50,000 Palestinians fled their homes from Haifa and neighboring villages. Today, there are millions of Palestinians living as refugees who for decades haven't been able to return to their homes and their land. Joining us now is Ilan Pape, the director of the European Centre for Palestine Studies. He's also professor of history at the University of Exeter. Ilan Pape, the Israeli line for the past 24 hours has been, look, this has been orchestrated and run by Hamas and those people who've died, those people who've been so severely injured are cannon fodder for Hamas. What's your reaction to that? Well, there's nothing new in the Israeli propaganda. It's full of lies and fabrications. Uh, we know that it's not the Hamas that organized these demonstrations. It was the young people of Gaza who are desperate and had enough both of the siege and the uh, uh, vision of a continued life as refugees. Uh, and the Israeli army uh, has been shooting 
mercilessly uh, unarmed Palestinians before that and will continue to do this as long as the international community would not uh, act forcefully against these policies and the ideologies behind these policies. Is there a dynamic for Israel here, and it's this perhaps, they, they, it, as a country, as a state, it cannot accept the fact of Nakba, because if you accept the fact of Nakba, you have to accept the right of return. If you accept the right of return, in that millisecond of taking a decision, the Jewish state ceases to exist. No, Israel as a racist state uh, uh, ceases to exist the moment it allows uh, the right of return uh, to be implemented. Uh, Israel ethnically cleansed the Palestinian in 1948 because the very idea of a Zionist state is to have a state as of much, on much of Palestine as possible with as few Palestinians in it as possible. This is still the vision of all the Israeli uh, political parties and all the Israeli politicians. The means of achieving that vision have changed. In 1948, it was through massive expulsion. Uh, since 1967, it is through enclavement and uh, demolition of houses and all kinds of other uh, crime, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And what we see today in Gaza is part of the same uh, Israeli strategy that sees the Palestinians as enemies, as uh, potential terrorists, and as the main obstacle for creating uh, and maintaining uh, a racist Jewish state uh, that unfortunately the international community in the last 70 years still legitimizes as if this is, can be also part of a world of democracy, human rights and civil rights. And when you're talking about civil rights and democracy and human rights, what is it about Israel that stops it admitting to or perhaps dealing with another potential reality that a right of return might be constructive, it might be transformative, it doesn't have to be destructive. No, you have to understand the nature both of the Zionist movement that created Israel and, and the character of the state that the, this ideological movement created. It's a settler colonial movement that created a settler state, uh, very much like apartheid South Africa. There is no room for anyone who is not part of the settler community, and anyone who is not part of the settler community is a threat, either potential or real threat, to the settler state. Therefore, uh, uh, their refusal to allow the Palestinians to return is nothing to do with the capacity of the country. It has to do with the ideological nature of the country. And uh, the, uh, this is the main reason, not only for the uh, uh, policy that does not allow Palestinians to return, it is also the same reason for the uh, policy of oppression, colonization, dispossession, and uh, the incremental genocide that is taking place now in front of our eyes uh, in the Gaza Strip. Ilan Pape, thank you very much. Now, it's been a day of diplomacy at the United Nations in New York. Claim and counterclaim on the ground and among the politicians on both sides of the 70 years of a divide. But the real story is about the people who live every day of their lives with the reality of Nakba. Here's their story in their words. In 1947, the Jews were attacking us on a daily basis. They came from one of the first Israeli settlements and they used to assault us and run. My father brought us here to the West Bank, leaving everything behind. The house, our property, our stocks of food. We first lived in camps. We adapted and survived. My name is Sarah Othman Jibril. I was born in Yazur. Our village was mostly an agricultural area. We used to grow citrus fruits there. We once owned large areas of land, which we also lost along with all that we had left behind. Even our stock of food, oil, olive, we left it all behind. We have not been able to return since then. The last time I was there, our home was not in place. It had been destroyed. We had all hoped to return one day. That is why each of us still holds the key to our property. Until this day, we are all hopeful that we will return. We will not falter or repent. We will not give up on our right to return. The Jews are not entitled to a single inch of the Palestinian territories. We are living in Palestine and we will die in this Palestinian soil.
Now, the right of Palestinian refugees and their descendants to return home is one of the key demands in the peace process and remains a cornerstone of the Palestinian struggle. A demand on Israel when it joined the UN in 1949 was that it would agree to Resolution 194. That's the right of Palestinian refugees to return to the homes they left just the year before. But after the war in 1967, Israel continued to deny them that right. Instead, it confiscated more Palestinian land and forcibly displaced hundreds of thousands of people. The UN says Palestinian refugees and their descendants now number more than five million worldwide. Many still live in refugee camps in Jordan, Lebanon and Syria. To this day, Israel rejects the right of return, believing it would destroy the Jewish character of the state. Israel also says Resolution 194 is not legally binding because it was a recommendation by the UN General Assembly and not a demand from the UN Security Council. In 67, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 242. Now, that one calls for a just settlement to a refugee problem. But for Palestinians, this has been a stumbling block. It didn't say they should be given political rights or territory. Bolivia's ambassador today gave an impassioned speech to the UN Security Council in a special emergency session, apologizing for the lack of action over Palestine by all nations. This Security Council, not just in recent years, but in recent decades, has failed the Palestinian people. And so, as a member of the Security Council, in the presence of my brother, the ambassador of Palestine, with us today, and through him, I wish to ask for forgiveness and say how sorry I am to the six million Palestinian refugees who've lost their homes and today live in camps far from the lands that saw their birth. I am sorry that for years the promise of the creation of a state of Palestine has not been fulfilled. I am sorry for the more than 50 years of occupation and for the continued increase of Israeli settlements in occupied Palestinian territory. But the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. defended Israel's continued aggression near the Israel-Gaza border. I asked my colleagues here in the Security Council, who among us would accept this type of activity on your border? No one would. No country in this chamber would act with more restraint than Israel has. In fact, the records of several countries here today suggest they would be much less restrained. Well, Riyad Mansour is the Palestinian ambassador to the United Nations in New York, speaking from the UN Security Council. He said the US was to blame for continuing to allow Israel to kill with impunity. The Trump administration up until today is refusing to listen to what the world is saying, to what is in the resolutions and international law. It refuses to listen. As a superpower, we should be defending international law. And it's a superpower that should be protecting the Security Council resolutions. They should not close their eyes to the situation on the ground. The United States decided to do the opposite. They decided to strengthen the intransigence on the part of Israel. They decided to protect Israel from international condemnation for their accountability, from any measure which would rectify this unfair situation for the Palestinians and their right to freedom and independence. This was the most recent decision on Jerusalem, motivated by the right-wing government in Israel to implement their policies and illegitimate practices, including the broad daylight murder of innocent civilians without any fear of consequences, because Israel has always had impunity. Let's talk now to Robbie Sabel. He's a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's also formerly a legal advisor at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He joins us live now from West Jerusalem. Robbie Sabel, welcome to this Al Jazeera News special on this Nakba day. Me. The critics of Israel are saying this that Israel has done nothing to stop the violence that's killed more than 60 people and injured hundreds more. What's your reaction to that? We're seeing another saga of the tragedy of the Palestinian people because of their leadership. We talk, you talked earlier about 48. If in 48 the Arab leadership would have accepted the idea that Jews also have a right of self-determination, they could be leaving, leading, living peacefully today. In fact, all the Arab armies invaded Israel in 48. We're again seeing Hamas 
using its population not for building an economy, not for building a society, but for trying to destroy Israel. It's a real tragedy, and I agree, Nakba is a real tragedy for the Palestinian people. We could have seen a, 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 a vibrant Palestinian state next to Israel, but for this they have to accept that the Middle East is a pluralistic area. It's not a purely Muslim area. Okay, where Jews is the evidence right Where is the evidence to support others. your assertion that Hamas is exploiting its own people here? Yes, we've seen the military claims that Hamas is using its own people as human shields. There's no evidence of that. We are seeing people on the ground, yes, young Palestinian men armed with tennis rackets because they are so good at getting the tear gas pellets back from where they came, they hit them with tennis rackets. That's not evidence of Hamas propagating or running a military machine as claimed by the Israeli military. Well, the answer is they've pro their tennis rackets have been fire bombs, hundreds of fire bombs, I've seen the fires themselves, grenades, revolvers, wire cutters. This is not a peaceful demonstration. It was, and they were paid by Hamas. And by the way, an interesting proof is today, Hamas decided to stop it and it stopped. In other words, there are about 4,000 people today, 40,000 years. At the turn of an instruction by Hamas, they have stopped the demonstration. They can renew it again. It, this is not a civilian, peaceful demonstration. It's an attempt by Hamas, and they've won it. In other words, they gain world opinion by seeing casualties. And I agree with you, when you see casualties, it's, it hurts. But this actually serves Hamas's purpose. They wanted to have the casualties to show it to the world. It's a real tragedy for the Palestinian people, as it is for us. Robbie Sabel, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, since 1948, there's been one tragic event after the next one in Israel and the Palestinian territory. Laura Burden Manley has more on the history of Palestinian uprisings since Al Akba. Well, a lot has happened since 1948. Countless conflicts spanning more than six decades have killed many more people. For Palestinians, almost two decades after Al Nakba came another tragic event Al Naqsa, or the setback. After the 1967 war, hundreds of thousands were expelled from their homeland when Israel captured territory in Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. In 1978, numerous uprisings by the Palestinian Liberation Organization in the Golan Heights led to an Israeli incursion into Lebanon. By 1982, the two countries were at war. In 1987, protests against the Israeli occupation turned into a popular uprising. Palestinians held strikes. Young people took to the streets. It was the first intifada. Israel reacted by killing and deporting Palestinians, closing universities and making mass arrests. The violence would continue for five years. Then, in 1993, Israel and the PLO signed the Oslo Accords. It allowed for limited Palestinian self-rule in Gaza and the West Bank. But when Israeli leader Ariel Sharon visited the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in 2000, he set off another round of anger and unrest by declaring one of Islam's holiest sites would always remain under Israeli control. The Second Intifada had begun. Over five years, at least 3,000 Palestinians and nearly 1,000 Israelis were killed. Under a ceasefire deal in 2005, Israel removed all settlements and troops from Gaza, but it still maintains control of its airspace, waters and entry points. And in July 2006, Israel launched airstrikes in Lebanon and bombed Beirut's airports. Two years later, the Gaza war broke out. Israel bombed populated areas of the enclave in what Palestinians called a massacre. Hamas shot rockets over the border, and Israel was accused of unlawfully using white phosphorus munitions. More than 1,300 Palestinians and 13 Israelis were killed. History would repeat itself in an eight-day war in 2012, with more than 160 Palestinians and six Israelis killed. But it was the 2014 bombing of Gaza which would have the highest human cost. More than 2,100 Palestinians were killed, most of them civilians. 66 members of the Israeli army, six civilians and a Thai national were also killed. 
Now, in October 2015, young Palestinians were accused of a series of knife attacks in the West Bank and Israel. Many were shot dead by Israelis, and within two years, attacks on either side had killed at least 285 Palestinians and 42 Israelis. Well, now tens of thousands of Palestinians are taking part in protests along Gaza's border with Israel. They're calling it the Great March of Return, and their demands are simple the right to return to their homes they left behind in 1948. Beverly Milton Edwards is a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Centre. She's also formerly the EU Special Advisor uh, to the Middle East Peace Process. She joins us from our studio in Belfast. Beverly Milton Edwards, one's not picking up on a particular degree or a strong degree of outrage outside of the Gaza-Israel border area. Do the Palestinians feel almost completely abandoned on this Nakba day? I think that if you look at their demands for rights and recognition, you might um, understandably see why Palestinians feel so um, abandoned and, and alone. Because what we can see is, is that despite the atrocity that has taken place or the allegations of the atrocity that has taken place, what we haven't seen is any movement from the international community to grant a hearing to um, increase the leverage to bring Israel and the Palestinians together around a negotiating table to debate and to reach peace according to these, to these rights. 70 years on, how valuable are Palestinian lives if 50 Israelis had been killed in Jerusalem yesterday, say, when Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump were doing their thing at the embassy, would the coverage have been utterly, totally different? No, I think that uh, we all agree, and thanks to the attentions of the international media, that every life is sacred and that um, journalists, independent journalists, human rights organizations and UN organizations, and as we can see from the debates today at the UN Security Council and in the General Assembly, Palestinian lives, no matter how they're lost, Israeli lives, no matter how they're lost in this conflict, do matter and should be debated so that we can get further along the road to a just settlement of this conflict because without this just settlement there'll be insecurity for both sides and I'm sure that Israelis nor Palestinians really want to look forward to the next 10 to 100 years without the prospect of peace on horizon. But Jared Kushner went away from his prepared text when he was giving that speech at the US Embassy in Jerusalem. He was talking about supporting a peace agreement. How can he possibly say, unelected though he is, how can he possibly say, I support the process for peace, there is no peace process, and yet he's there doing the one thing guaranteed to make the situation worse, not better? Well, again, I mean, Jared Kushner, in many respects, is speaking for, for himself. He enjoys no official position in terms of um, American policy on the peace process. Now, what we need to look at is the role of the Americans in forums such as the, uh, the United Nations and the responses of the rest of the international community. Now, surely we recognize that America, by making the move of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, has broken with the international consensus and questions are being asked. And what we are seeing is evidence that from other parties within the international community, including the European Union, major states like Turkey and South Africa, that they're not going to go along with the American with the American okay. move and that they themselves will make their own efforts towards achieving some form of peace in the Middle East. Understood. Beverly Milton Edwards, thank you so much for your time here on Al Jazeera. That's it from me, Peter Dobby, and this Al Jazeera News special, continuing coverage through the coming hours on this network. From everyone on the team here in Doha and on the ground in the Palestinian territory and Israel, thanks for watching. We'll leave you with some images of the past few days, days of fighting, death and injury, days that have changed the relationship between the Palestinians and Israel, undoubtedly. Bye-bye.
proved themselves readier than the Arabs to profit by the British withdrawal. In the fighting for Jerusalem, the old city was captured by the Arab Legion. Elsewhere, the troops of the new Israel prevailed. You are from Britain. Do you accept to give Manchester to some other people? And if you are American, I ask you, do you accept to give California to some other people? Or do you accept the status quo of occupying Manchester by some other people, by the Chinese, for instance? And then reach agreement. الذي لن أهرب منه هو أننا ندافع عن أرضنا وعن مقدساتنا المسيحية والإسلامية وعن قدسنا الشريف وعن حقنا في الحرية وفي الاستقلال الوطني وتقرير المصير وحق اللاجئين في العودة في العودة إلى وطنهم Many of the people living in Gaza today are refugees and they're demanding their right to return home. There really is a feeling here that people have lost their fear. They get right up to the border fence. The people here will tell you they have absolutely nothing left to lose. 